Okay, so welcome, welcome. Um, we're definitely going to have more people sign in, as you can see. Um, it is Doc here. We're going to get started. We are covering a geometry review with me. Basically, what I did is um, over the weekend, for those who came on Saturday, you got a packet that had 51 questions. My students saw that packet again for the past couple of days. And what I did is I looked at the data that I collected from my period one class, which is um, they tend to do pretty decently. And I found the questions that we did the worst at. And I figured that if we did the worst um, of my students who tend to get higher scores, perform the worst on these questions, and maybe other kids also struggled with them. So we're going to do that. And then I do have at least one Kahoot that we're going to go over if you want at the end. Um, I've budgeted for it to be like two hours worth of my time, but I truly think that we can probably push this out in about an hour, hour and a half. Um, if you are new, of course, feel free to um, ask questions, put your speakers on or your microphone on, whatever you want. You're welcome to participate. That's the whole point. Um, same thing in the chat box. So let's go ahead and get started and people will come as they go. So I did align this to the AKS. Remember the AKS is what's called academic knowledge and skills. Um, that is what we as your teachers at South and throughout the county focus on um, in terms of what we need to teach you. And so this AKS is AKS number 10. It says explain how the criteria for triangle congruence, angle side angle, side angle side, and side side side, follow the from the definition of congruence in terms of rigid motion. So before we really get to the question, there's just a couple things to remember. Remember that when we get to rigid motion, this again deals with our favorite transformations. And we know that there are four transformations. However, only three of them deal with rigid motion. Those are reflections, um, rotations, and translations. So that's really our key three things. So anytime that we look at um, questions relating to the standard where it talks about side angle side but also references rigid motion we have to see like what exactly happened so let's take a look here Porter incorrectly states said triangle GKJ and IKH now immediately I've told you this a thousand times if you're one of my kids I mean it even more sincerely now anytime they give you a congruence statement and remember congruence is an equal sign with a little twiddly deep that statement, this is congruence, or just similarity, which is just a little tweedly deet, but nothing else, immediately stop, don't even continue reading the question until you write the letters one on top of each other. So we have triangle GKG and we have triangle IKH. And the reason why we do this is this allows us to be able to see which of those vertices and which of the sides correspond. And corresponding sides and corresponding vertices are extremely crucial to your success because that's going to help us know what we're supposed to do. And again, this is definitely one of the questions we looked at Saturday. So this one question might be a little bit of a repeat, but let's keep looking. Porter says already, just based on this information, that the triangles are congruent. But Porter's wrong because we don't have enough of information. Remember, anytime that we're talking about triangle congruence, you always have to have three things, whether it's three sides, side angle side, so two sides and an included angle, angle side angle, so two angles of the included side, angle angle side, and technically people are like, oh, but a hypotenuse leg, you only need two. Dude, you need to have the right angle, that's three. So still, it's not as simple as that. So it says, what additional information do we need? Well, let's mark off what we already have. We already know that Porter noticed that these sides were congruent. And we know that angle G has to map to angle I. So on your scrap paper, when you draw this image, make sure that you also kind of note it. This is something Hartpence says, that so she'll put images around the vertices. Make sure you note it so you can see how it maps. Because in this case, the triangle was actually rotated. It wasn't reflected. So it was actually a rotated triangle. So that's going to tell us that our points are going to be kind of different. So we know that we have a side 
And we also have, as most of you know already, these, the vertical angles. So when we think of our favorite song that's so annoying, but we'll always remember, you can sing along. Side, angle, side, 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 angle, side, angle, 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 side. And we know, of course, the last one's hypotenuse leg. So when we think of that song, now I've been singing it again in my head as I'm writing this down. We see already that we have the vertical angle and we have a side, but notice how the vertical angle is not touching the side. So because the vertical angle is not touching the side, we immediately can eliminate side angle side because the angle has to touch both sides. We can eliminate side 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 because we have one angle and we can eliminate angle side angle because that side is not touching the angle. Also, when we look at this, we notice that there's no right angles clearly that are evident. So because of that, we're also going to eliminate hypotenuse leg. So the only postulate that we could do, hi, honey, if you just signed on, can you please mute your microphone? There's a couple of people not muted. So let me just do that for you. You can always unmute it when you're ready to talk, but please go ahead and mute your mics. Um, but the only thing that we could do is angle, angle, side, be simply because that side is not touching the angle. So if we only look at the postulates, we have eliminated angle, side, angle, because our vertical angle isn't touching the side. We've eliminated side, angle, side, because the angle is not touching either side. We've eliminated angle, side, angle for the reasons listed above. And we now know that it could only be choice D, which is angle, angle, side. So sometimes it is as simple as seeing which of the vertices correspond or even looking at, okay, what do I have when I label it? And simply because this angle is not touching the side, that's enough reason for us to not continue. Okay, I noticed some new names who have signed on. Welcome. Um, please make sure your microphones are muted. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box. Um, this should be over between 7 and 7.30. If you want to play the coot, it'll, kahoot, it'll probably be about 7.30. You can always also unmute un your microphone to participate. Okay, that's that question. Let's move on to the next one. The next question we screwed up on had to deal with number 11, which is proof theorems about lines and angles. These are some of the theorems that you need to know. Hint, if I were you, I would get a piece of paper and I would write these down because these are the concepts you need to make sure you know. You need to know that vertical angles are congruent. Now, real quick, in order for you to have vertical angles, First, you have to know that you have vertical angles. So if you were ever writing proofs, you can't just say vertical angles are congruent. First, you have to describe the angles as being vertical. Then you can say the vertical angles are congruent. You also need to know that when you have parallel lines, nope, I decided I don't want to do it that way. When you have parallel lines cut by a transversal, and I made it look funny on purpose, we know that all of the acute angles match and all of the obtuse angles match. So that's really important for looking at it. But then we also know there's some types of relationships. So we've talked about before that when you have, and I'll do it the normal way, like this, I've talked to you about how you have the inside of a house is interior and the outside of the house is exterior. So um, guys, you can turn off your camera if you want. You don't have to, but some people prefer to have their camera turned off. Um, remember that if your angles are outside of the parallel lines, this piece is considered anything in here is called interior. Anything outside, like outside your house, is considered exterior. Then we know that this transversal is super important. In order for us to have interior and exterior angles, we have to make sure they touch the transversal. So here, where's my little guy? Here it is. Here, if we have this angle here and this angle here, notice how they're both touching that transversal. So that's that one. So we know that there's alternate interior, alternate exterior, corresponding angles. And then this is the main part here that I wanted you to see. 
points on a perpendicular bisector of a line segment are exactly those equidistant from the segment's endpoints. What exactly does that mean? Well, remember for perpendicular bisector, we have a line segment. Then you used to use the compass and you went boop, 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 and then you noticed that you had this. Clearly my sketch is not perpendicular, but let's pretend. It says points on the perpendicular bisector. So basically it means you can pick any point that you want. So in this case, I'm going to pick this point. So this point right here is equidistant from the endpoints. Well, what are the endpoints? The end points are the end of the perpendicular bisector. That's all this theorem is stating. So if you knew this, this question would be super easy. And literally, all we get it is we got it right from the AKS. So all it means is anytime you pick a point on the perpendicular bisector, you create congruent segments. The other thing that's kind of super cool is you also end up creating an isosceles triangle. So you technically could then explore things like the base angles are congruent and go from there. So anyone have an idea, sugar shoots, of what our answer would be for number eight? The perpendicular bisector theorem states that if a point is on the line um, of a perpendicular bisegment, bisector of a segment, um, then it is what? What answer would you pick? Hint, it's highlighted in yellow. Yep, A is correct. Nice job. Here, parallel to the segment, well, we can see that if this point is here, is it parallel? I mean, technically, perhaps, but in order for it to be parallel, it has to be a line. It can't be a point, so it wouldn't be that one. This one, I'm sure they meant midpoint, but equidistant from the segment's midpoint, that doesn't really help us. That's just going up and down, so it wouldn't be choice C. Um, perpendicular to the endpoints, that's not really going to help us either, so it's got to be this one, because perpendicular from the endpoints would mean we'd have two right angles, which you can have two right angles and a triangle. So please just know that theorem. It's right from the AKS. Here's another example that I was trying to show you in terms of the corresponding. Proof theorems about lines of angles. We know that we have to have alternate interior, corresponding angles, etc. As a reminder, corresponding angles you're going to see a lot. Corresponding angles happen when you can do a translation and get the exact same spot. So if we think about it like north, south, east, and west, if I have one here, it maps to right here. If I have my two here, it maps to this one. That's what corresponding is. So pairs of congruent angles are um, in the diagram below. Which pairs of lines must be parallel? Anyone feel like being brave? What's our answer? B? Anyone else? Just kidding. Clea, you got it right. Okay, let's double check. So what we do is we want to care about the angle. So if I was sketching this out on my paper, I would sketch it out, even though I was doing it the wrong way. I've got G, H, J, and K. So the angles that they gave me were this angle here, and this angle here. Remember, anytime that you have corresponding angles, they have to be touching the same transversal. So in this case, these are corresponding angles on G is the transversal, so J and K have to map. Now, technically speaking, it is true that these angles right here are also corresponding, but again, they're corresponding on line H. Some kids think, well, this has one line here, this has two lines here. Oh, it's alternate interior angles if you turn your head. It's not, because this was only one line and this is two lines. So you have to make sure that when you do it, you say, okay, what are my parallel lines? What's my transversal? 
All right, let's look at our next question, question or AKS 12. Prove theorems about triangles. Theorems include the measures of interior angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees. So most of us remember that already, that anytime you have a triangle, if this is 30 and this is 60, that's not going to make sense, 65, we know we can add these up, get 95, subtract, and then write 75 and get our missing angle measure. Okay, that's the first one. 180 degrees equals a triangle. As a side note, 180 degrees also equals a line. Next, it says that the base angles of an isosceles triangle are congruent. So if this is 40 degrees, by default, we would do 180 minus 40 learn that there's 140 degrees left. And because it's an isosceles triangle, the opposite angles have to be congruent. So we would just simply divide this by two to get our measures. Now, here's something that's super cool. If you have, what would happen if you have a tr small teeny triangle, but the vertex angle is still 40? What would be the angle? What would be the measure of the two base angles? Even though it's a smaller triangle, but the vertex angle is the same. All right, in this case, it's still gonna be 70. Remember, angle measure does not matter in terms of the size of the triangle. Think of it kind of like dilations. Remember that whenever we do dilations, our dilation theorem is angles are congruent, the sides are proportional. So even though this is a smaller triangle, the angle measures would still be 70 and 70. And then this last one is um, the, meet, the segment joining um, the midpoints of two sides of a triangle is parallel to the third side. So we've kind of discussed this before, some of us. If you have a triangle here and we attach the midpoints, which frankly, I did not quite draw that line straight, but let's just pretend. This line here and this line here are gonna be parallel, okay? Now, basically the other thing that happens is if this measure is five, this is 10. Anytime we go from the small line to the big, we're going to multiply by two. Similar with that 30, 60, 90 triangle, how we took the small side of opposite the 30 and we multiplied it by two to get the hypotenuse. Anytime we go from big to small, we're gonna divide by two. And actually that process is a lot what you're gonna see also when we get to circles unit in January. The other thing that happens is basically when we join now, now this picture is really sucking. So let's, let me draw another picture. What happens is, is we actually create these hidden parallelograms. And that's why the mid-segment theorem works. And then finally, the medians of a triangle meet at a point. That point is called the centroid. And again, median is you just take a triangle you're like, what's the middle here? What's the middle here? What's the middle here? And you just connect them. Beep, 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 beep. Beep, 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 beep. I just kind of messed that one up that way. And then what am I missing? This one. And so this point right here is called the centroid. And actually, Mrs. Peace is big on this one. She would cut triangles and she'd balance a piece of tr a paper triangle on a tip on her pencil. And it's because she was balancing at the centroid. That's where there's perfect gravity. Let's move on to this question. Proposed tower is located below. The company wants to create a beam parallel that connects the midpoints. So here's the middle of JK. Here's this middle here connect the points. Now, hopefully, if you notice, the bottom is 50. So if the bottom's 50, this was a really poorly written question. Obviously, this is smaller than 50. So you should have been able to eliminate A and B immediately. Looking at it, you should have labeled C. So you could have just guessed D and gotten it correct. However, the formula is anytime you go from small to big, you multiply by two. 
And any time you go from big to small, you divide by two. And 50 divided by two is 25. Okay, I love this question. It's super hard. Proof theorems about triangles. Theorems include everything we just talked about in the other one. Now, this one I showed a very annoying video of a guy who was like, had Mr. Triangle and he was talking in this other voice. That was what I showed you on Saturday. But basically it says, what details show the second step? So Brianna is trying to prove the measure of the angles of an in, of a, in any triangle add up to 180 degrees. The first step of her proof is to draw the triangle below, which she did, she labeled it ABC. Brianna adds details to her drawing in the second step, which of the following most likely shows Brianna's second step? Well, here in this step, she dropped a perpendicular. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't give us much help because that just pretty much adds more angles up. And look at everything has to do with 90 and 90 degrees is not what we're going for. We're shooting for like, how can I get this 180? In this choice, choice B, the next step was extending this line and then making theta. This is really good for proving the exterior angle theorem. And remember the exterior angle theorem was whatever this outside angle is, it's equal to the sum of the two inside angles. This last one is dealing with a parallelogram. And off the top of my head, I honestly can't think what she's trying to do, except maybe prove alternate interior angles. I don't know. Another math teacher who's on might know the answer to that one. And then finally, the last one, which I didn't, which I completely skipped was choice C, which is the correct answer. And basically the way that you, she would have pro proven this is she draw a line at top and she'd be like, dude, these are alternate interior angles. So because these are alternate interior angles, I know that alternate interior angles, I know that those angles are congruent because alternate interior angles are congruent. And I also know that a straight line is 180. So that's kind of like how she would prove this one. So that would be choice C. All right, let's go on to number seven. Ooh, let's not go to number seven. Let's look at, let's see, that was AKS 12. Let's do another AKS 12. This one we actually did pretty good on, but not everyone did pretty good on it in my second class. So that's why I kind of added it. Okay, this is again the whole concept of proportional. So in triangle ADE, notice how ADE is the bigger triangle. The segment BC is drawn parallel. So right away, if I have parallel, I want you to think parallel, I've got corresponding angles. Okay, then it says ADE and ABC are similar. Stop. Remember, anytime you see congruent, oops, or similar, what do we do? We put the letters one on top of each other. So here's ADE and then ABC. So right away, we know that A maps to A, D and B map together, and E and C map together. Which of the following proportions can be used to show that, here's where people mess this up, BC divides AD and AE. So BC divides AD and AE. That's what we want to know. So anything that we pick, it needs to deal with those things, like period. So if we look at the first one, it says M over M plus N. Well, that makes sense. M is this section over this whole section. Well, that looks good equals, oh, sugar shoots, it's the correct answer, P over P plus Q. This is actually the correct answer. It's the correct answer because it's proportional and because it sticks with the lines. It's like the yellow over the long yellow, the little purple over the long purple. Let's look at the next one. M, P, M over P, which is like if I redrew this triangle, it would be this side over this side equals this side over a, a sum. Well, that doesn't make sense. And then here, this one, some kids put BC over DE. Here's the catch. Technically speaking, that is a correct proportion. The issue is it doesn't relate to the problem. 
the set the, what relates to the problem sugar shoots is this one bc dividing these lines so we have to make sure we pick pieces of those lines all right that was a, that was like a dok 231 okay next one um, AKS 13, proof theorems about parallelograms. Here are some things that you need to know. You know, need to know opposite sides are congruent. Well, remember that in a parallelogram, all of these things are true. Both sets of sides have to be congruent or both sets of angles, the opposite angles have to be congruent, okay? Or you can say that the opposite sides are parallel, but it has to be all of them. It has to be top, bottom, left, right for all of those. The other thing it says, the diag diagonals of a parallelogram bisect each other. So it doesn't mean congruent, but it means that if I split these up, I get my little teeny weeny middle ones. Okay, also rectangles are parallelograms with congruent diagonals. Like literally speaking, that is what's in the AKS. So it says, let's see which of these fit for a rectangle. Well, diagonals bisect each other. Well, that's true because that's true of all parallelograms. Diagonals are congruent. It's in the standard. So yes, that's part of the standard. And diagonals are perpendicular. Nope. That is only the case for rhombuses and rhombuses babies, which happen to be squares. Um, and technically kites. Okay, so it has to be one and two only, which is choice B. Next, we don't actually have a lot of questions, believe it or not. We only, we're already halfway through with the questions. Then we're going to go into the Kahoot. If you have any questions, please tell me. Next, again with AKS 12, remember, any time that you see similar triangles, especially Similar triangles embedded on top of each other. I want you to think corresponding. Boop, 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 corresponding. This one, I don't know why so many of my students got this wrong because we always look at it. Here it says shared angle. Okay, whatever. Here's given. Here we have similarity postulate. Then it's like, well, what happens next? Follow statement from three, but look at. It literally says in the next statement, corresponding angles. And look at, does this say corresponding angles? No. So because of that, I know my answer has to be angles. And then which angles are corresponding? DGH corresponds to DFE. So it's choice C. All right, next. Um, which is always true of isosceles triangles. I tried to show this to you before. Remember that no matter what size the isosceles triangles are, as long as the vertex angles are the same, in the previous case, I think I said 40 and 40, then we know the base angles have to be the same. And when that's the case, we don't have congruent triangles because the sizes can be different. We don't have equilateral triangles because technically all the angles would have to be the same. We don't have right triangles always. We occasionally do when it's a 45, 45, 90, but we do always have similar. And that's what we need to do. And we have similar because of the angle, angle postulate. Moving on to trig. Understand that by similarity, side ratios and right triangles are properties of the angle and the triangle, leading to definitions of trigonometric ratios. Okay. In triangle XYZ, stop. Do you see a triangle? I don't see a triangle. Well, if I don't see a triangle, what do you think I need to do? Yep, draw a triangle. Triangle. And because we know that it's trig, it's because we see cosine, we know there's a right angle. Okay, also, I see that it says, um, x cosine x and cosine y and it tells me i'm sorry and y and it tells me angle y is 90 degrees so i can put my y here my x here and my z here frankly it didn't matter where i put my x or my z as long as i put my y in its correct space then it told me cosine x here is a trick whenever you see cosine at, or cosine sine or tangent and you see it in the proportion we can still do the same thing. So 
Freddie was with us, with us this weekend and he got Sokotoa style in his head and he stupidly sings it in the car. I love him, but remember Sokotoa style. So, 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 Sokotoa style. Ka, ka, ka. Sokotoa style. To, to, to. Right? So if this is on the formula sheet, but we know that sine is opposite hypo or opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse and tangent is opposite over adjacent. So how here it says the cosine of X equals 35 over 37. This is what we're going to do. Well, cosine X, X is our theta. We label our hypotenuse, angle, adjacent, opposite. Now we have to look at the next thing. Oops, look, I put 35, 35 over, that's not right. 35 over 37. Now we know cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So all that means is my adjacent side has to be 35 and my hypotenuse has to be 37. But I still have to work this problem out. I don't know my opposite side. So guess what? Just do Pythagorean theorem. Remember, anytime that you have two sides, you can use a squared plus b squared equals c squared to get our third side. So all I'm going to do is do 35 squared plus, I don't know, squared, let's make this a b so I don't confuse you, equals 37 squared. Get out our trusty calculators. 37 times 37 is 1369. 35 times 35 is 1225. Subtract. B squared is 144. And take the square roots and we get positive 12 and negative 12. But of course, we're not going to have a negative length of a side. So now that we've done that, we know our side. So now we can actually address the problem. Why don't you look at the problem? Now that you know the sides are 12, 35, and 37, what would be the correct answer? Yay! It is B. Okay, let's take a look. For it to be A, we would need opposite we need, here's our theta x, and we would need opposite 12 over adjacent 35. And that's not what they gave us. You'll actually learn in Algebra 2 that that's called cotangent. I'm going to also look at x because it's already labeled. Sine x is opposite over hypotenuse. So our opposite is 12, and our hypotenuse is 37, so it can't be choice D. Let's move on to change our theta. Now, if our theta is Z, oh, that's ugly. Here's our theta. That's huge. Now, remember, we always label the hypotenuse angle adjacent opposite. So now we can look and say, well, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Well, adjacent is 12, hypotenuse is 37, so that is our correct choice. So this is a DOK2 question because first we had to use a Pythagorean theorem to get the missing side, and then we had to figure out which was the one that we needed. Okay, you guys are doing fantastic. We literally have five questions left, then we're done. AKS21, and then we're done, and we can play Kahoot if people want to play Kahoot. Um, AKS 21, understand that by similarity, side ratios in right triangles are properties of the angles and the triangle, leading to the definitions of trigonometric, trigonometric ratios for acute angles. What does that mean? Pretty much the same thing we've already talked about. The, this main theorem says if you have sine A, if we have our beautiful triangle, right triangle, A, B, C, that has to equal cosine b. You have to memorize that. No matter what you have here, the other one is always going to be the exact same thing minus the first angle. 
So it's kind of like anytime you add A plus B, obviously you always have to get 90 degrees because if you have a right triangle and you eliminate this 90 degrees, you only have 90 degrees left for these two angles. So that is the main formula you have to see. You don't have to know angle measures. You can just know the formula. Now, you can know angle measures, and that really will help you. So like here, it says, I'm sorry, you can know the sides and work from there. So similarly, as we did in the other problem, here it tells you cosine of alpha is 5 over 13. Well, we know we have our SOHCAHTOA. Ka is adjacent over hypotenuse. So if here's my theta, I've got my hypotenuse, angle, adjacent, opposite. So if this is 5 over 13, I know my 5 has to be this side and my 13 has to be this side. If I really want to get the other side, I could do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I could plug in my appropriate lengths, solve. I know I'm doing this part fast, but that's totally fine. This side becomes 12. And then based on this information, it says, okay, if cosine theta is five or cosine alpha is five over 13, what is sine? And then right from there, I can be like, well, if sine beta, that becomes means this is my theta. So this is my hypotenuse. Here's my angle. This becomes my adjacent side and this becomes my opposite. Well, what's sine? Sine is opposite hypotenuse. What's my opposite? Five. What's my hypotenuse? Relative to beta, 13. So it's this one. So you could have just remembered the formula that if one is sine, the other one is cosine, and then you subtract the angles, or you could have done the extra work. This one I took from a different source, but a lot of kids got it wrong, so I wanted to show it to you. Anytime they tell you like um, sine or cosine equals a variable instead of numbers, I want you to think of it as it's that variable divided by one. So in this case where it says sine B equals R, I want you to think, okay, well, here's B. Here's my hypotenuse angle adjacent opposite. Sine I know is opposite over hypotenuse. So I'm going to put my letter, letter R here and the number 1 here. Then it says, well, cosine B equals S. Okay, well, if cosine B equals S, well, I'm just going to call that S over 1. I know cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So if this becomes my theta. I have my hypotenuse stays the same. Hypotenuse. Oh, what did I just mess up on? Oh, no, I'm fine. Angle adjacent. And then we still have our opposite here. We know adjacent is S. So now I'm going to put my S here. So really, this triangle, even though it's abstract, my side measures are these. So then it says, well, what is sine C minus cos C? Well, if C becomes my theta, I can label my hop, my opposite, my hypotenuse, angle, adjacent, opposite. So sine C is opposite over hypotenuse. Well, my opposite is S. I know it's getting crazy. My hypotenuse is 1. Well, any number divided by 1 is itself. Then my cos C is my adjacent side over my hypotenuse over one. So then I just say, well, what's sine C? S minus what's cos C? R, S minus R, choice C. Oh my God, I can't even tell you how many people got this wrong. I wanted to cry. A baseball diamond is a square with bases 90 feet apart as shown below, which is the closest distance between the second base and home plate. Dude, if it tells you it's a square, if this is 90, this also has to be 90. Now, there's two ways that you can do this problem. One is you can think of, oh, this is an isosceles right triangle. 
So if these two sides are 90, this side must be 90 times the square root of 2. That's one way you could have done it. The other way you could have done it is just done Pythagorean theorem. And that part I'm not doing in my head. Square root of 1, 6, 2, 0, 0. 127.28. So the closest would be 127 feet. So we could have done special triangles, but we also had another option. Okay, 33, this is something I gave my students a lot of vocabulary, so it would behoove you to know it. I think there's only one or two questions on your district assessment relating to vocabulary, but just in case. A set of A contains all points on a plane um, that are distance D from a point P. What describes A? Well, a ray looks like this, so each of these points is not equidistant from the end point, so it's not going to be A. Um, a circle, well, we have one center point, and then we have infinite radii, kind of like a bike wheel. That's the correct answer. An angle, again, all of these points are not the same distance from our end point, so it's not C. And a line segment is the set of all points contained by two end points, so it's not D. Last question, and then we can play Kahoot if you guys are up for it. Describe the rotations and reflections that carry a rectangle, parallelogram, trapezoid, or regular polygon on itself. Um, remember that a rectangle is only a 180 degrees, or it's directly up and down and across. There's no other lines of symmetry. You cannot do a rectangle on the diagonal. A parallelogram is 180 degrees rotation and nothing else. There are no lines of symmetry, none. A regular trapezoid, like any size trapezoid, has no rotational symmetry. An isosceles trapezoid has exactly one line of symmetry, straight down for the bases. And then the regular polygon, remember we take 360 degrees and we divide it by the number of sides, which is what we're gonna do for number 41. Patrick rotated the pentagon about its center. Well, what do we know about pentagons? Pentagons have five sides. What degree measure could he have rotated the pentagon to map it on itself? Well, obviously, here is my awful pentagon. Obviously, it's not <laughs> equidistant. Maybe we should try another one. Boom, 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 boom. Still not equidistant, but better. All you really have to do is 360 divided by 5. Um, 3 goes into, th I'm not doing that in my head. 360 divided by 5. I thought it was 72. It is. So we have 72 degrees. But here's an issue. That's not one of our answers. So we do 72 plus 72 and get 144. Also not one of our answers. Then we add 72 again and get 216. Also not one of our answers. Then we add 72 again, and we get 288, which is the correct answer. So you still do the 360 divided by the number of sides, but you have to pay attention to how many sides that you need to do. Okay, that are all, that, that are all. that's all the questions I wanted to go over. If you could please go in your chat box to let me know if you would be interested in playing Kahoot. Um, okay, perfect, I'll play the Kahoot. Yes, I will end up uploading it but um with my computer it's going to take like probably until tomorrow to get it uploaded but i do upload them to youtube and also to our website okay this kahoot can you let me know that you can see the screen i do not want to good automatically move through and perfect and then we're gonna pick our random nicknames. Um, let's see. 